Hey guys, it's Will with Adventures in Anime, my first ever video here. I will be talking about Jinro Wolf Brigade. This is a pretty famous movie from what I understand. It's one of the anime that I have known about for a while and have been meaning to watch for a while, and I just got around to watching it uh, yesterday. This movie came out in 1999. It was directed by Hiroyuki Okiura, and it was written by, and I wrote his name down here, uh, Mamoru Oshii, who uh, I think he's really well known because I think he directed um, Ghost in the Shell, if I'm not mistaken, the movie. Um, and he... He didn't write the manga, but he also has written manga, and he wrote the first ever... I might be wrong about this, but I think he wrote the first ever animation that was designed to go directly to video in the 80s in Japan, when that was like a new thing before stuff was going on TV or coming out in theaters. Um, and he um, is like really well respected by the Wachowskis and James Cameron and people like that. So there's a lot of pedigree that went into this movie. And I forgot to say, but I think I did say this came out in 1999. So... This movie was incredible, and like I said, I haven't seen that many anime movies, this is all very new to me, but this movie really blew me away. Just in terms of the plot, the animation, the animation is incredible. Like I said in my previous video where I explained what this series is, I lived in Tokyo, and so this takes place in like a, it's like an alternate history, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but it's post-war Japan. Technically post-war Japan ended in 1952, if I remember correctly, like from 1945 to 1952 is what is officially known as post-war Japan, but... You could say that anything after 1945 up until, like, whatever, 64, when the Olympics happened, is like post-war Japan. I think that this is supposed to take place in the 60s, based on the fashions that people are wearing and based on the chronology of it. So it takes place in that era, and the and it, it looks at this massive expansion of Tokyo in terms of consumerism, the economy, the government... Um, and the landmass of it, basically rebuilding after the war. And so the animation is this really amazing thing of, of having this intimate, these intimate small spaces that are like these traditional Japanese kind of areas, and then also this enormous city that's going up around it, and the layers of animation, the detail of the animation, the way the characters are animated, it's really amazing. And it really, like, and again, I don't have a ton of experience with this, but I've seen bits and pieces of enough anime to know that this animation is really fantastic. And using the animation and the weather, they create this really awesome mood. So like it's raining and there's a lot of stuff that takes place at dusk or at dawn and it's dark and it's kind of murky. Um, things take place underground in certain scenes. So in terms of the, the plot, this is just a really, really excellent thriller, right? So as you may or may not know, I have a graduate degree in screenwriting and I spent many years reading screenplays for uh, done by production companies, studios. I sometimes work with screenwriters, um, helping them like touch their material up and um, kind of like go from a draft to a finalized thing. And this, um, the script and the way the story unfolds here is really, really phenomenal. So it's it's a character driven movie with really, really strong characters. If you don't know what it's about, there's a uh, uh, the central figure is this guy who's in a special wing of the Japanese military slash police who are fighting these kind of like radical left insurgent terrorist types. And he is out on a mission and there's a, he finds a teenage girl with a bomb and he's got her in his sights and he doesn't pull the trigger and she blows herself up uh, like right in front of him. And then he ends up meeting her sister and uh, it kind of like unfolds from there. And so it's, it's a really meticulously plotted, very intelligent thriller in which all of these things are happening behind the scenes and there's, oh, you meet all these characters and they all, they all know each other because of the nature of their jobs. So the, the setup of the script is like immaculate because you have all of these characters who all know each other for logical reasons through what they do professionally or because they're like cops and terrorists and stuff like that. Um, but they all have secrets and their secrets come to the surface throughout the script and the plot becomes more and more complex and intricate. But because they all know each other, they also have these very kind of long-standing, very deep personal relationships. And so it's really engrossing from a character level, but works really, really well um, as a plot too. So I found that to be really, really cool, really interesting. And then the other thing that I want to talk about is the metaphor here. So Little Red Riding Hood is a story that comes up in the plot that characters talk about Little Red Riding Hood. And there's two female characters and both of them are seen wearing like long red coats with hoods, right? So th the Little Red Riding Hood metaphor works on basically like every level that this story exists, right? So you have the guy who's like the cop and he's chasing these terrorists. And so you have the thing of like the, the, the vulnerable child and then the wolf, right? And the, there's a lot of talk of wolves in this movie and like the wolf sheep 
kind of dichotomy like that, kind of the nature of society, right? The cops are wolves and the people are sheep, or the terrorists are wolves and the people are sheep, or the cops are the wolves and the terrorists are the sheep. Like, it works in every way that you could possibly conceive of it, even when you look at the macro social stuff of what they're looking at, which is consumerism. And there, it's really interesting because there are these kind of passages where people are speaking to each other, but the visuals go to other things. So, like, characters will have, be having a conversation, but then the the animation will cut to, like, people walking down the street or, like, scenes of these construction projects and stuff like that that show you kind of the, the social um, milieu in which the movie takes place, right? And through this, you see, like, the construction industry and you see the consumerism and you see people who have become successful. But then you see homeless people, people whose homes are being raised to, to build these high-rises and stuff like that, and the people who are kind of pushed out in this drive for... A, like a kind of more general success across the board and that applies to the wolf sheep thing too right of like the, the capitalists or the people who are making these consumer products or the government or uh you know the people who run the construction companies and stuff being the wolves and everyone else being the sheep and some of the sheep are very well tended obviously right but then the wolves have to eat and so some of the sheep's kind of fall victim to that and that's like a metaphor that comes up again and again and it works so so well throughout this whole movie i was really really impressed by that um this is just a really really great movie if you want to read into it in terms of the you know the complexity and the intelligence of the script the philosophical stuff that it's talking about these metaphors of the wolf and the sheep and also what another thing i found to be really interesting is that it, this this tells you right off the bat for like voiceover narration that you get in like a lot of sci-fi movies or like if you were to watch like a movie like The Running Man, the Schwarzenegger movie, you know there's that like text at the beginning of the movie or like they even do that in Star Wars, right? Like the scrolling text that sets up the whole context of the world so that you don't have to have like all of this exposition in the movie itself. So this starts with that and in the context of that, um... You're, you're given kind of this idea that this is an alternate history of Japan after the war. But what's really interesting is what they're actually doing is taking the kind of existential crisis of post-war Japan, or I guess the multiple existential crises of post-war Japan, and this nation at the crossroads, right, that's completely rebuilding and what kind of nation will it become in the future. And they're turning that into physical objects through um, this this like special militarized, militarized police force and these radical terrorists and then these people who get caught in the middle. And it, it also kind of looks at this idea that like individual people are adrift in this enormous kind of system of factions and inevitably through family, through personal connections, through what they're exposed to through the media, through their own personal beliefs, they gravitate towards a faction. And by attaching themselves to these factions where people become radicalized and become power hungry, well, a lot of people's lives are destroyed. Um, and again, that's the wolf sheep thing, right? Which is really central to this movie. So again, this is Gene Rowe, Wolf Brigade. is released in 1999. Uh, my name is Will. This series is called Adventures in Anime. And we'll be doing a lot of these videos, hopefully. Down the line, I'm going to be watching a lot of anime, both movies and series. And I'm open to reading manga, too, if anybody wants to just comics to me. Um, the only manga I really read is Akira. Um, I've read, like, individual issues of other things. But I read Ghost in the Shell, the first volume of, like, the graphic novel Ghost in the Shell. Um, but other than that, I haven't really read any of it. So um, put your uh, suggestions in the description, or the the comment section and let us know in the comment section what you think about this movie what your take on it is what your analysis is and we will see you next time